Welcome to Frankly Speaking About Family Medicine, a CME podcast series where each week we translate today's late-breaking clinical research and news into tomorrow's practice. I'm Frank Domino, professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and editor-in-chief of the 5-Minute Clinical Consult series. Be sure to visit primed.com slash podcast after the discussion for more information about today's article and to claim CME CE credit. You are seeing Elizabeth, a 71-year-old patient who's here for follow-up of her hypertension, diabetes, and osteoporosis. She's doing well and has no complaints today, although she notes she's gained a couple of pounds this past winter. Her BMI is 26. She takes a brisk walk most days of the week and feels good about her exercise. Before coming into the office, you review her medication list and count a total of six medications you are currently prescribing. As you're trying to be mindful to de-prescribe and senior patients, you decide to discuss stopping the bisphosphonate, alendronate, that she's been on for the last five years. You started this after a DEXA scan showed that she was at risk for osteoporosis and might benefit from this drug. You obtained that when she was 65. However, now she is very worried about her bones and is hesitant to stop her medication. Hi, this is Frank Domino, and joining me today is Dr. Robert Baldor, professor and founding chairman from the Department of Family Medicine at UMass Medical School, Bay State in Springfield, Massachusetts. Hi, Bob. Hey, Frank. Good to be chatting. Yeah. Um, osteoporosis and, and when to stop treatment is a challenge. Um, I know you want to discuss a recent publication that talks about the benefits and harms of prescribing bisphosphonates beyond five years. Can you give us a quick overview of the issues that prompted this study? Yes, this is really interesting. Uh, and it, it, it's it, it, an it's issue for me as well with a lot of folks trying to think about these, these, these medications and how long to keep them going. And uh, so a lot of this actually started, and we think about it, right? Uh, bisphosphonates, their first line treatment, clearly for preventing osteoporotic fractures. Uh, studies have shown a significant risk reduction within the first five years of treatment. And uh, data beyond that is limited, but a 2015 um, task force by the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research rec- it actually recommended a drug holiday after uh, five years for women who were not at high risk for fracture but continuing for those who were. And um, however, they said there was limited study. And of course, the Women's Health Initiative is a very large uh, uh, cohort study, retrospective study of that with self-reported uh, use of uh, two years of uh, bisphosphonates did not find any significant association um, if you extended beyond uh, five, uh, five years. And uh, they actually found that an additional five, additional five years of treatment was associated with increased risk of risk hip fracture. So, um, so following that, uh, the FDA looked at this and they actually concluded the benefits of continuing beyond three to five years were unclear. So we've been using this medication for 20 years now. So uh, because of that, there's a lot of real world data out there to look at. And that's exactly what this study uh, did was they looked at real world data for people who have used this medication to draw some conclusions about risk versus benefit. All right, great. So we actually have we have real world data. What does it show? So this was a retrospective study, and this was uh, using a Kaiser Permanente out of California using their data. They identified women who had actually started on an oral bisphosphonate, and that could have been a, a lendronate, risronate, or a bandronate between 1997 and 2019, and they were actually able to track whether or not they had uh, dispensed the prescriptions for them. So they had to take at least. 60% of the time to be taking the medications for the five years after initiating treatment. They followed these women. They looked over the next uh, ensuing uh, uh, decades uh, for up to 2014, and they wanted they tracked it after five years, seven years, or 10 years of oral bisphosphonate treatment. And there were several exclusions. I won't think we have time to go into all of that now, but they wanted to make sure that they didn't have uh, people with advanced kidney disease or cancers or other things that would have would have interfered. And they looked then to sort of say, okay, how the endpoints were hip fracture, death, an exclusionary event such as developing a cancer or renal disease, or they ended their membership so they weren't being tracked uh, in any anymore. Excellent. Well, this is the kind of um well-designed cohort study that we can get some real-world data out. What, what did they find? 
Yeah, super sample size. They actually had 29,685 women, mean age of 71. Most of them were treated for five years, but about a third, 37%, continued treatment for up to seven years, and another 9% were on treatment for 10 years. So they looked at these groups. Now, a hip fracture was diagnosed in 1.7%. Uh, so 507 of these women on alendronate developed hip fracture. By the way, this was an older group, so 5.7% of the sample died. Another 5.7% developed other illnesses that then excluded them for further uh, further look at this. So they looked at the 507 women who had developed a hip fracture, and they wanted to see was there a difference between whether they took the bisphosphonate for five, seven, or 10 years. And they found no uh, differences in the uh, communal, uh, in, in the risk of hip fracture after five years of treatment for those who remained on seven years, or if they continued treatment for another 10 years. So they're saying we didn't see a lot of benefit beyond five years for this. They noted though, while the differences in hip fracture at seven years was not statistically significant versus five years, there did appear to be a little lower risk of hip fracture for women taking it up to up to seven uh, up to seven years. Okay, so what we've got here is five years provides um, some benefit and possibly an additional two years provides a benefit, although that wasn't statistically significant, and certainly a total of an additional five years on, uh, on top of your initial five years provided no benefit. That's really helpful. Um, so how do you think we should um, counsel Elizabeth today and, and, and in general after five years of treatment with our patients? Yeah, so I thought this was really uh, an excellent study in that it said, yes, five years of treatment is beneficial. <laughs> so uh, completing it after that, not so, uh, not, not so much. So for a patient like Elizabeth, I would perform a risk assessment, though, before making a final decision. She's not had any fractures. She doesn't smoke or drink excessively. She has an old BMI, and she exercises uh, daily. She had a low risk now for fracture. I'd recommend discontinuing the treatment. You know, on the other hand, if she was at high risk, say she was a thin smoker, maybe a, a family history of osteoporotic uh, fracture as well, I would think about continuing it for another two years. But certainly, I don't see any benefit to going uh, to going uh, beyond uh, beyond that. Thanks, Bob. I, I I totally agree with you. I'd I'd probably counsel her aggressively on on continuing to do weight bearing exercise, get adequate vitamin D, and so forth. But I think after five years, most of the benefit is in place. And um, if she was really concerned, I'd probably let myself get talked into a little bit more time, but certainly not another five. Bob, this is very helpful. Thanks so much. All right, Frank, take care. Practice pointer. When treating your female patients with osteoporosis using a bisphosphonate, best outcomes occur with five years of treatment. Additional years may not provide any additional reduction in hip fracture risk. Join us next time when we talk about a new approach to risk stratification when patients have a TIA. Thank you for listening to Frankly Speaking About Family Medicine, brought to you by PrimeMed. To claim credit and receive additional information about the article referenced in today's episode, visit primemed.com slash podcast and see you next week.